every layer one will compete with every other layer one for everything. It, it's, it's going to be a, a war between the layer ones on, on all fronts. All right, folks, really exciting episode today talking about all things L1s, L2s, DeFi. Um, I'm here with Chow Wang. Chow is the uh, a contributor at uh, DeFi Alliance. Um, he's been in the industry for a very long time. I think going on a decade, not to age you at all here, Chow. Uh, trader, um, and honestly, just one of the smartest minds, uh, in my opinion, on the space. So Chow, welcome to the show. Appreciate it. Thanks yeah. for having me. Yeah, of course. Um, so you, I'm, I'm basically, this is going to be, uh, this podcast is going to be a regurgitation of your tweets and we're going to dive deeper into them uh, because I basically um, end up bookmarking all your tweets. And uh, so I'm, I don't know, <laughs> <laughs> I just want to dive into them. So let's see. So the first one I want to talk about here is um, you've been paying attention to the space since you started trading it. And I'm going to maybe botch this number, this date, but like 2011, 2012. And you tweeted out that 2021 is the first year where it really feels like crypto is going to eat the world from every angle. And I think a lot of folks have have typically thought of basically the internet changed how information moves moves across uh, from people to people, right? Like it changed media, changed a lot of that kind of stuff. But finance has been stuck in this pre-internet age. Um, but but in your tweet, you said from finance to tech to entertainment and culture, crypto is going to eat the entire world, and you're just starting to have conviction around this. Can you just like what what do you mean by this? Well, uh, there uh, there are a few ways we can look at this. One is uh, from a trading point of view. Like basically up until 2019, 2020, if you trade an alt, you're basically trading and leverage Bitcoin. Like the entire market moves together. And for good reasons, there, there was really nothing other than Bitcoin and Ethereum, to be honest. And Ethereum, even Ethereum up until 2020, there was nothing really, there's no app that, that you know, the average person can use uh, until 2020 where DeFi came up. Um, and so it took many years to build out the infrastructure for Bitcoin, it took many years to build out the infrastructure for Ethereum. There's nothing else really. But this year, everything took off simultaneously, right? DeFi, DeFi obviously took off in 2020, but this year we have gaming, right? Like Axie Infinity just took over the world, especially Southeast Asia, Philippines. Um, and that's the gaming side of things. And then NFTs, uh, by NFTs, I mean specifically the, the art side of things. Um, and, and that made a huge impact on the cultural um, side of uh, crypto. All these celebrities are looking, are, they either bought uh, NFTs or they, they're look, working with artists, you know, to issue NFTs. NBA top shots earlier, earlier this year, that made a huge impact into the culture uh, side of the world. Um, and then uh, we're probably going to see a few social, decentralized social media uh, that will take off in the next year or two. Um, that were that are built on Web3 stack, so like just a bunch of some you know bunch of ver different verticals um, taking off simultaneously, and it's impacting culture, it's impacting you know socialization, like you know social media, um, in addition to obviously money, which is Bitcoin, and in finance, which is DeFi. So yeah, yeah, it feels um remember 2017 ever it feels like a lot of the ideas from 2017 are actually starting to play out and it kind of feels like what happens in crypto is you have all these great ideas and everyone's just kind of right on the ideas but wrong on the timeline so you have ideas i like, feel exactly the same like 2017 yeah. fucking denticoin and shit like that yeah. you know 20, if, you, if you tell me denticoin today i it's not heresy anymore like i can see that happen like I mean, obviously, I'm not talking about Dentacoin. But I'm not talking about the scamming side of Dentacoin, but like a network for dentists is not crazy anymore, right? Breaking also, news, Chow comes on the podcast <laughs> and is still Dentacoin. All right. <laughs> Good to know. Um, and also, use, people used to talk about like decentralized Uber 2017. That, that was like, it was ridiculous to hear about decentralized Uber in 2017, but now it's not crazy anymore. So it's definitely a matter of timing. Yeah. Well, I mean, why is it? Because like, uh, so, so Blockworks has a lot of new employees who were not in the 2017 bull run. And we, you know, Mike and I have been talking to them about, you know, things like NFTs. NFTs are not new, right? NFTs were around in 2017. Crypto kitties clogged up the entire Ethereum blockchain back in 2017. Why, like, why is it that these, that it takes another cycle for this stuff to play out? 
probably a combination of things. One is uh, the infrastructure is actually ready, uh, more or less. I mean, 2017, um, Ethereum couldn't scale. Now we have Layer 2s, um, Solana, Polkadot, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so there are actually some consumer-grade apps that can be built on, on uh, the crypto tech stack, the Web3 tech stack. So that's number one. Number two is just the fact that more people through like basically a 10 years of speculation have actually installed in the infrastructure, uh, including notably, you know, the, the crypto wallets and be comfortable with the crypto native user experience. Um, so it, it took a whole cycle to get people install these and for the infrastructure to be, to be ready. I think these are probably the two main, and obviously a lot more founders came into the space and many of whom stayed uh, during the, the bear market, built through the bear market. I think these are the main, main reasons. Yeah. It's starting to feel like, so this, I mean, like if we, I kind of want to go through a timeline of DeFi with you to lead up into some of my next questions. So can you just kind of give us this timeline of DeFi starting with compound maker, like 2018 through liquidity mining, 2020 DeFi summer through yeah. up until like, I would call this like the L1 wars that we're in right now. And then yeah. we can start talking about where things are going. I remember, uh, uh, in 2016, uh, Ethereum has the Ethereum Help Foundation had a web page of every single app that was built on Ethereum, and there were like maybe 40 or 50 of them. Um, many of these, uh, I guess, most of these early projects uh, did, did, didn't go anywhere. Um, the first DeFi project that um, I thought really took off was Maker, uh, the stablecoin in um, 20, I think they started in 2018, can't remember exactly, but they, they really took off um, you know, a year or two uh, after. The, the, the thesis for Maker back then was, Maker was an app, uh, Maker is an application rather than an infrastructure. And therefore, even if the underlying infrastructure fails, Maker could um, you know, transition into another uh, layer one, for instance. But anyway, like, what I'm trying to say is Maker was probably the first DeFi project that has product market fit. Uh, 2020, DeFi summer, obviously. Uh, I think, um, arguably, it was Compound that started the DeFi summer with uh, the liquidity uh, mining program. Um, it really incentivized a lot of people to, like the, the free money part of, of, uh, of liquidity mining programs, really incentivized people to look into DeFi and install the infrastructure that they had to install, uh, notably the wallets, uh, web, uh, browser wallets, right? to participate in, in DeFi and the larger crypto e ecosystem. Compound uh, arguably catalyzed everything, the entire DeFi server. Um, some of the most exciting projects that came during DeFi summer, Wi-Fi. Wi-Fi was something, was, uh, was really interesting in a couple of ways. One was that it, remi it reminds people a lot of, of the early days of Bitcoin, uh, that it's, it's a, arguably a, a fair launch. And two, people can build on top of Wi-Fi. That's also, DeFi Summer was also when people realized that how important composability it was for crypto in general. Like all these different different apps could interact and build on top of each other. And, and Wi-Fi showed us that. So that was 2020. That was one of the most intellectually fascinating uh, eras of crypto for me personally. And the, and the least amount of sleep in a 60 day time span, I think uh, any of us have ever gotten. <laughs> totally. So like fast forwarding a little bit. So we had DeFi summer, we start moving into like NFTs have just been pretty absurd the last few months, obviously. Now it's really feeling like layer one wars driven by Solana and Avalanche. Um, the conversation starting to heat up. So, and then alongside the, these layer ones, like Solana and Avalanche, you have, which, which to me, it feels like Solana and Avalanche have been driven by high gas fees. And, you know, just a lot more users on Ethereum kind of rolling off into and getting excited about things like Solana and Avalanche. But then alongside that, you have these layer two roll-ups. And I don't know if you ever, did you ever read Haseeb Qureshi's post like two months ago? And he said, I'm worried that nobody's going to care about roll-ups. Yeah, I, I briefly went through that. Yeah. And I, I read it and kind of brushed it off and didn't really understand what he was talking about. But now I completely see it coming to life, which is... You know, you've got these amazing things like Arbitrum and, and Optimism, but nobody seemed, but everybody's focused on things like Solana and Avalanche and these other layer ones. So what is your kind of like thesis on how some of this stuff is starting to play out? I think that the single most important factor 
is where developers are going. Um, and we saw that well before Solana and Avalanche took off, like many months ago, that um, Solana started, um, you know, they, they bootstrapped this critical mass of developers. And it was not a surprise at all that a few months later, Solana, the entire Solana ecosystem took off. Um, so the most important question you need to ask yourself, you want to know where the future is going is where the developers are going. Now, why the question now, the, the question now is why are the developers choosing Solana and other layer ones versus Ethereum? Well, gas is, is an obvious issue. Um, perhaps another important reason is if you have Ethereum and, and five or 10 different layer twos, it, it becomes really confusing. The actual developer experience might not be, um, might, might be great, but the fact that you have so many options just creates um, a lot of confusion for, for potential developers. I think that's also one of the main reasons why developers are choosing a computing layer one. Yet another important uh, you know, uh, factor is Ethereum so far has been by far the most innovative uh, ecosystem, right? Like 99% of new projects happen on Ethereum. Everything that, that happens, like most of the things that happen on other layer ones are basically copy pasta of Ethereum. I'm trying to create a mental model around it and it feels like we're kind of seeing basically the apps. What, so what happened last year is the apps on top of Ethereum would incentivize capital to move into the different apps. Um, and they would incentivize them in different ways, like Sushi incentivizing people to come over from Uniswap. But that was all on top of Ethereum. And now we're just starting to see different ways to incentivize folks to move layer one chains. Yeah. And I'm like, I don't know, there's all this talk right now about a multi-chain future. And I'm trying to create this mental model of like, do you basically have a chain? Is it is it driven by the chain or is it driven by the use case? I think it's more the latter. And the, the, the primary reason is composability. So um, you have all these different verticals in crypto. You have DeFi, you have gaming, you have social. Um, I think a few years from now, it will be clear that all these are going to be composable with each other. And it's going to be really, really important. So like, for instance, if you have a game, where uh, a play to earn game, where people earn some money by playing the game, they want to be able to exchange it for some other asset in the DeFi platform, right? Uh, meanwhile, if you have a, a social media platform where a creator can make some money off of uh, you know uh, their, their creation, their content, they want to be able to you know maybe cash out and then use that money to to play some game or something like that. So composability be between different apps are going to be very important, and therefore I don't see a world where you have a layer one specifically for gaming. You have a layer one specifically for DeFi. You have layer one specifically for social, etc. I don't see that happen. It's going to be a layer one with a variety of different uh, types of apps. So you'll have, I'm, I'm trying to make sure I understand that. So you'll basically have mul multiple different layer ones that are competing with each other. And there are entire ecosystems that are getting built on top of them. Every layer one will compete with every other layer one for everything. It, it's, it's going to be a, a war between the layer ones on, on all fronts. In the same way that, you know, iOS competes with Android? Yeah, this is a pretty good analogy, I think. Yeah. So I want to actually go back to that very first question about like where, uh, you know, you know crypto is eating everything basically. And there's this talk, um, who is it? Maybe uh, Suzu popularized it and Dan Held was talking about it in the more in the Bitcoin focused community, but this, this super cycle, right? And so when you think about as you, you know, as someone who's experienced multiple cycles, I just want to get your idea on whether you buy into this idea of the super cycle or whether this cycle looks a little bit more like the last cycles, in which case we might have, I don't know, three, four, five more months to run. We do a big pullback, things fall 70, 80%. And it just continues as usual. I think we, we first need to define what a super cycle is. I don't know what people's definition is, but here's how I think about this. Uh, I think we've already had a 10 year super cycle in crypto. <laughs> the entire decade has been a super cycle with three or four mini cycles. My current view is sometime next year, uh, we're probably going to reach the top of, of the cycle. Uh, maybe summer next year. I don't know. I have, I have no idea. But 
it's not going up forever. It's not up. It's not up only. <laughs> Kobe, um, Kobe, Kobe would be very upset with you right now, Joe. It, it's going to be down only from that. <laughs> but uh, what I don't know is, uh, is it going to be like Nasdaq twenty two thousand year two thousand where you have ten you have a ten year bear market, or is it going to be a another short cycle of three or four years, like a bear market of three years and then back again, or is it going to be? more or less flat, I have no idea. I, I, I can put maybe an equal probability on all three. I've got this tweet right here, February 7th, 2021, ETH is going to five to 10, no, five to 20K by the end of this. There's no reason to sell your long-term holdings here. That was February of this year. Seems to be a nice little call. Um, still think ETH is going that high, 20K. I mean, this is a huge range, like five to 20. <laughs> I'm picking the high end here, Joe. <laughs> yeah, just, just to, you know, demonstrate that uh, I have no idea, but I think it's going higher. It's going much higher from here. Yeah. In terms of where we go in the more short term, like we move in these cycles, right? Where it's like a Bitcoin cycle, um, DeFi cycle, ETH cycle. What do you think is the next little mini cycle here? Is it, I know you were rotating back into some Bitcoin. It does feel like, there's actually too little focus on Bitcoin right now. Um, everyone's so, uh, you know, but also ETH feels like uh, there's not enough focus on ETH right now. All the focus is on kind of other layer one. So where do we go in the short term here? To be very honest, I haven't thought a lot about the short term. Um, the, the rotation back to Bitcoin is really because I felt other things are getting, especially NFTs are getting very frothy. Um, in the near term, not a whole ton of catalyst for, for DeFi, to be honest. Um, I think the, the derivatives are probably the main catalyst, but it might not be as big as what we saw in, in DeFi summer 2020. Gaming, we saw a, a, a quick cycle because Axie just crushed it, just took over the world. Um, but there aren't that many very large scale games yet. So I don't really know on that front either, but I tend to agree with you. Like right now, the main focus is the, the competing layer ones. Yeah. Um, because Solana has demonstrated that they, they've bootstrapped this, this organic developer community. Um, other layer ones might have a good chance to do it too. Yeah. On the layer one stuff, um, back in February, you, you tweeted out, no Ethereum killer is going to be able to kill Ethereum. Um, the network effects and just the developer talent base is too strong. But you said it's the arrogance of the ETH maxis that mindlessly ignore competitors and lack any sense of urgency that ends up killing Ethereum. Um, I've started to notice something in, in ETH, which is that, you know, you've got all these Bitcoin maxis on Twitter, which, you know, sometimes, you, you know, we can kind of almost laugh at the at the maximalism. And now you're yeah. starting to see a lot of ETH maxis. Yeah. And I'm just like pulling my hair out here being like, guys, this is what we were kind of... Uh, you know, roasting for the last, uh, for the last couple of years here. And, yeah. and now you've turned into it. So what, what, what did you mean by this tweet? The maxes are incons completely inconsequential to, to the success of, 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 a, of a network. Bitcoin maxes have zero impact on the success of Bitcoin. And Ethereum maxes have zero impact on the success of Ethereum. But the one thing I would say is, is, is that I, I do feel like to be fair, like I, I've, I've been supporting Ethereum from literally from day one, because I went to the same school as Vitalik. I'm four years older, so I met, met him at school. But I wanted to support a product that, com that comes out of Waterloo, and I did. So I fucking love Ethereum from day one. But I have to say I'm very frustrated because of the lack of sense of urgency. Like, there, there was a window of opportunity for Ethereum to basically kill everything, everyone else. But it, it did not happen. So, and now we're seeing a multi-chain world. You think they could have just moved faster? It comes down yeah. to speed. There, there was no, like, you know, decentralization is great, but when you have such an immature technology, right? Before 2018, you need a strong group of people to drive that forward. You need a centralized group of people to drive that forward. And that's what happened with Solana, with Polkadot, with Avalanche, right? They're not decentralized at all, but they're working because they're moving forward. And in order to move forward, you need a small group of people to make it happen. And I'm, I'm frustrated because Ethereum did not move fast enough to be yeah. honest. Empire is proud to be supported by Avalanche. There is a layer one war heating up in crypto and Avalanche is at the center of it. Avalanche is one of the fastest smart contract platforms in the industry. 
I've been looking into the ecosystem recently and it's pretty amazing how fast it's growing. I wanna jump into the three reasons why I'm so intrigued by Avalanche right now. Number one, like I mentioned, they've got this great ecosystem. There are over 200 different projects live. There are over 100 different projects in the pipeline right now. These are DEXs, AMMs, lend and borrow platforms, NFT projects, you name it. It's probably getting built on top of Avalanche right now. Number two, Avalanche Rush. This is right around the corner. Ave, Curve, Sushi uh, are all launching as part of the Rush program. There are native apps like Banky and Pangolin um, that already have user incentives. So I really recommend you go check those out. Last but not least, the Avalanche Bridge. It is fast, it is easy to use, uh, it is cheap. Users have been loving it. Uh, it enables folks to seamlessly move your assets from Ethereum over to this Avalanche ecosystem. So that's all for now. Thank you, Avalanche for sponsoring Empire. I'm gonna continue exploring Avalanche in future episodes, uh, but for now, go follow Avalanche on social media, uh, check them out on Twitter to stay updated on upcoming news. And uh, yeah, let's get back to the episode. Oh man, it's funny you say that. Like, I feel like uh, a lot of the Bitcoin folks for like for a very long time were like, ETH is not decentralized enough, ETH is not decentralized enough. And that was like the main, you know, harping, they would like harp on that. And then ETH, you know, got very usable and a lot of things were built on it and now people love ETH. And now ETH, you see the exact same thing. It's like a lot of the ETH folks are like, Solana is not decentralized enough. Solana is not decentralized enough. And here's, Sol here's Solana getting a lot more developers and a lot of things built on it. So yeah, you, you know what people used to say in 20, 2015, 2016, like people used to say, like when the Ethereum first came out, the Bitcoin maxis said, or not even Bitcoin, the, the, the overall general crypto community said, Everything that happens on other layer ones are just experiments and they will be built on Bitcoin. Now that you think about what people said at that time, it's, it just sounds ridiculous because nothing happened on, on Bitcoin in terms of app application development. And same thing happened with Ethereum. People say everything that happens on other layer ones are just experiments and they will ultimately be built on Ethereum. Honestly, like it's, it's, it's the same thing, I think, to be honest. Yeah. It's the are lack of urgency. Are you excited about anything getting built on Bitcoin or have you just fully formed this view that Bitcoin is like lightning and all this kind of stuff? Are you excited about that at all? You know, uh, I don't think there is a very strong, to be very honest, I don't think there's a very strong probability for that to happen. But it is a very contrarian bet if you want to bet on the Ethereum, uh, the Bitcoin ecosystem, because everyone, um, you know, no, no one thinks anything will happen on, on, on Bitcoin. So it, it is... It is a positive EV bet, um, and I think the two main so the, the, the two main factors one is Jack Dorsey and the other one is Bitcoin being adopted as a legal tender in Latin America. That is really really important. Like if that happens across multiple countries, Bitcoin actually is going somewhere. I think in, in terms of like not just as as a money like a store value. That's that's there, Bitcoin already wants store value. I think, but more importantly as as a form of payment or an application. Uh, development, development ecosystem, become Michael somewhere. So you actually, you, you think that El Salvador news is, is very big? I think it's very big. It's, it's far bigger than Tesla. Than, than yeah, it's, Tesla well, yeah, it's, a, it's a country, it's a country versus a company, but we all just love Elon Musk. So uh. we all love Elon Musk and we know yeah, yeah. Tesla is, is a, like even their balance, <laughs> like as a company, it, it, might, it might be bigger than El Salvador, but the political impact and the higher order effects of El Salvador adopting Bitcoin uh, as legal tender is far bigger than the Tesla news. Yeah. Usually what happens is that you need two guys or two people to, to do something really crazy for everyone else to FOMO. When you have one person to, to do something crazy, everyone will laugh at them. And it's what's happening now with El yeah. Salvador. But the moment you have a second country start buying Bitcoin and putting it uh, in, in their central bank's balance sheet, everyone else will FOMO. Yeah, it's the new space race, right? It's not U.S. versus Russia anymore. It's uh, El Salvador versus the next central bank that starts buying, and we've got a race to buy the Bitcoin. So, yeah. Uh, let's talk about DAOs for a second. Are DAOs of this cycle complete boom type of thing, or is it they get some traction, need more tools, not scaled up enough, not enough infrastructure, and they're a next cycle. Their next cycle is maybe DeFi. Yeah, you know that. Uh we, we love investing in, in, in DAO infrastructure rather than in, in DAOs themselves. So um, to your point, there is a lack of infrastructure being built. Um, and and, and the, 
in order to have a ballot season, I think you need the infrastructure to be built. And what, these are like voting mechanisms, the forums, the ability to pay contractor or contractors, like uh, people who work at DAOs. Is, is that what you mean by the infrastructure? All, all these things and, you know, communication, like a Web3 native uh, communication tool, a tool for people to just launch a DAO, right? To, to one, one button click and, and, and launch a DAO. Basically, you know, SaaS, SaaS software, like SaaS businesses for, for Web3, right? Mm -hmm. Like that, that, that's what I mean by, by DAO infrastructure. Yeah, like in the same way that 2017, we saw the, the Fireblocks of the world pop up, but that Fireblocks is really just a, a SaaS business for, for CeFi. Yeah. Same thing in, in your mind? Yeah, perhaps. Yeah. Got it. Can I play devil's advocate for DAOs for a second here? I want to get your take on this. Um, as, as a founder, DAOs to me, there's a, there's a reason there's hierarchy, I would say, um, and that things aren't completely flat all the time, and the corporate structure works quite well. And DAOs, to me, feel very slow and very messy. Um, and it actually seems like you probably get less done at a DAO, in my opinion, but that they're much more global and that they're cheaper to run because you're optimizing for the cheapest labor because anyone can put their hand up, basically. Yep. I'm trying to think about it from like, a, like I get it from like a industry-wide macro lens DAOs make sense, but from like the founder's point of view of like why you would launch a DAO instead of a corporation, it does feel a bit more like a regulatory arbitrage and yeah. like a, I don't know, like it's cheaper to, <laughs> cheaper to run and you can raise more money and there's a regulatory arbitrage. But I'm trying to think about it from the founder's point of view here. I 100% agree with you. That, that, that's why I don't, I, I'm, not, I'm not fully into this, bought into this DAO season thing um, because DAOs have problems. The, the biggest problem is they're too decentralized, right? Like if you want to achieve something big, you have to make hard decisions as a founder. You have, you have to centralize decision-making hierarchy. Yep. Um, I think actually the best run DAOs will have a pretty centralized component. Like they will have a, a, a centralized team that drive things forward. I think in most cases, DAOs actually don't make sense. But in cases, the cases where DAOs do make sense are those where you can blur the line between, um, the team and the users. Um, so like in, in the traditional, in the legacy, like legal system, you have a company and you have people outside of the company. So you basically have two worlds, right? But in the DAO um, world, I think the line between the company and people outside of the company will be blurred. Um, so you, you can have sort of almost three groups of people. You have the core team contributor, and then you have the people who are sort of between the core team and users, and you have people that are completely outside. So these are the, the this is the one type of DAO I think can work. Like, again, like this is super abstract. I don't know how many use but cases. What is, but what is that scenario? Like, is it like communities? Like it, it feels more like communities turn into DAOs and not companies so much. Exactly. I, I don't see companies turning into DAOs. It's more yeah. communities. There's a way for community to, to for somehow align incentives with each other, with each other, hmm. but again, driven by a centralized team. It's it's almost a must. Like I, I think that's the only way for DAOs to work. Yeah, yeah, because it really does feel like um, you know what it is. DAOs do very well in bull runs when everything's happy go lucky and everyone's making a bunch of money and things are good. But in a bear market, uh, DAOs I have a feeling will struggle. They're gonna fall apart. I mean, look, look at them. Like let's. On, let's use a spectrum of governance here. Like DAOs are here, companies are here, right here is the military. Like even the US military operates very differently than the US government, where it's a complete, it's basically a dictatorship where you, yep. you have to obey your boss and your boss has to obey the boss's boss. And the reason they do that is because in times of war, dictatorships win out usually. Exactly. And, and, and you need a uh, strict hierarchy. So yeah, bull, bull market, DAOs sound great. Bear market, I think it's going to be a struggle. The, for the only reason why startups survive in bear markets is the founder. Yeah. Community, decentralized communities will fall, fall apart in bear markets. So I 100% agree with you. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. Uh, who's got that book? Hard Thing About Hard Things by Ben yeah. Horowitz. Yeah. Very Horowitz, good book yeah. about that. Yeah. yeah. All right, let's talk uh, DeFi Alliance and then we can start to wrap this up. Um, can you just fill folks in on what you're building, um, what, what you and the team are building at DeFi Alliance? DeFi Alliance started as a hobby project, side project. Uh, for whatever reason, it started, just kept on growing and growing. I don't know why. And now we're like 10 full-time people, fully self-funded. Um, 
we're building a uh, we're focusing on building a community, and the community consists of two personas. Uh, one is the best startups, and two is the best mentors. So we try to find the best startups, get them together, and also find the best mentors that can help uh, these startups. Um, that's really our our, our focus. Um, we're, we're trying to think about um, how we can help startups in a way that other accelerators cannot help, right? Like YC, for instance, uh, again, like I don't know much about YC. I don't know how they work internally, but it seems like YC is, is very generalist, whereas uh, we're very specifically focused on, on crypto, Web3. Um, I mean, we, we started with, uh, we're, we're called the DeFi Alliance. We're going to rebrand soon, by the way. Uh, and that is because um, we're expanding our, our uh, focus um, beyond DeFi into the rest of, of Web3. So Web3 Web Alliance, is that the No, it's such a boomer. Like, name we, we, we talk about it internally. It's such a boomer title. I, I hate it. Uh, <laughs> we, have a, we have a slightly better name. Uh, we'll see. But like some, something, we're, we're, we're going to announce something uh, pretty soon. So it's a combination of the rebrand and a pretty big organizational change. Uh, we're... By the way, it turned into a DAO, uh, but more more details uh, to come. Is that you? You heard it here for first. DAO you DeFi Alliance Alliance rebranding turning into a DAO. <laughs> you heard it here first. Amazing. That's exciting. Uh, I like that you roast DAOs and then uh, announce that you're turning into a DAO. So that's uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's a great it's a great move. Yeah. Um, so for folks, who who is DeFi Alliance relevant for? Founders who are building in Web three. Um, founders who are building Web3 and mentors who are who want to uh, meet the best founders, early stage founders, to see, you know, to meet them or to get a feel for where the space is going um, and uh, perhaps want to invest, right? So these are the two groups of people that, that uh, we're targeting. Got it. And do you guys have a fund as well? Or are you, like, is it the YC model or do you raise fund, like a big fund? What's that model? We, we invest uh, in the start in some startups that go through our salary, but we're not doing the YC model. The YC model, I think, it's like seven percent for uh, like one hundred twenty-five k or something for a seven percent, something yeah, yeah. yeah, something along those lines. We're not doing that. I don't think anyone is capable of pulling that off in crypto. Um, I was going to say, if you can get a seven percent for one hundred twenty-five k right now, good on you. <laughs> uh, that, that, that's why I think anyone who thinks they can beat YC or beat the YC of crypto is, is kidding themselves. Yeah. Actually, one thing that got brought up at the at this conference was it was a big venture firm, like a tier one venture firm that said they're losing a lot of deals to crypto um, to like the Parifies and the Delphi's and the frameworks of and the multi coins of the world. And um, yeah. and one thing that came up that they said is that they're losing deals because they don't have a trading arm, which I found really interesting. And, you know, when they expanded on this, it basically said, look, and there's a, there's an unlimited amount of capital going around right now. Anybody can can go raise a big round right now but not that many venture firms have all, have a great trading team to market make to provide liquidity so is that i'm curious have you seen that as well or is that just a salty tier one venture firm who's uh, kind of new to crypto being upset that they're losing deals i've never seen anyone who lose deals because they don't have a trading arm to be honest oh, maybe I mean, this it, venture it, firm is just uh, not doing too well <laughs> it, it's certainly it's certainly a factor like founders definitely want their token to be liquid, but it's not, on, it's not the number one thing on their list of priorities. Like it's not even top 10. Yeah. There are far more important things that great founders care about. Hiring, legal, token economics, product, go to market strategy. Like all these things are far more important than having a, you know, a market making a arm. Yeah. Um, all right. One, one non-crypto question for you. And then we're going to wrap it up with a question I like to ask folks at the end. Um, Brian Armstrong tweeted out today or yesterday about longevity. I had Christian Angermeyer, um, big psychedelics investor on the, you know, on the podcast uh, recently, nice. very into longevity. Um, I've heard you talk about longevity. Is that just a bunch of crypto people who have made a lot of money who are now like, I want to live forever? Like, is that just, you know, I've, I've got the money and now I want to live, focus on my health. Like, why is there such a big focus on longevity right now? And I guess why are folks so excited about longevity? Um, and I actually two part question and why and, and, and how, if I agree with this, like how does someone play the longevity bet aside from eating, you know, being more healthy? Like how do I, how does someone invest in longevity? Like, how do you think about that space? Yeah, these are really good questions. Uh, um, 
I think, you know, uh, obviously there, there's a huge overlap between crypto and longevity. I think the primary reason, reason why crypto people are super excited about longevity is, in a way, longevity reminds of crypto people of the early days, is that it's, it's really at the bleeding edge and it's so controversial. Like, the average person does not get it, does not want to touch, does, want, does not want to hear the word immortality. And by the way, immortality is not the goal of longevity. Health is the goal of longevity. And that is because aging is the number one risk factor for almost every single chronic disease. So if you can solve the aging problem, you can solve most of the chronic diseases. Longevity is um, something that, that crypto people really care about because it's like bleeding edge, it's controversial. It reminds me of them of the early days. Um, I, I think it's the closest thing to, to the early days of, of crypto for me personally. Mm. Um, and part of the similarity is also regulations, right? Like regulators hate crypto and regulators hate the word immortality, longevity, anti-aging, by and large. Um, they, are, they want us all to die and they want us all to be broke, Chow. That's, uh... <laughs> I, actually, I, I take it back. They, they don't hate it, but they're not, they're, they're not friendly enough and they're, they're not moving fast enough. They're not moving as fast as science and technology. Um, I, th I think some of them want to help, but they're not moving as fast. And, and so the regulations are, are really lacking for promoting like, good research in, in longevity. So th these are main reasons why there's a huge overlap. I don't think it's because people have a, a, a ton of money and want to live forever. I don't think that's the, that's, that's the reason. However, I do think that the smartest people in the world, they do want to live longer because they realize that living 80 years is not enough to achieve the greatest things in the world. Because 80 years basically means like, I don't know, like 50, 40, 40 years of, or something of, of, you know, productive years. That's not enough for planning for the, you know, building the greatest things, achieving the greatest things. Like humanity needs far more than 40, 30, 40 years to plan, to plan ahead, right? I think they realize that and, and that's why they think longevity is, is important. Those are the main reasons for the overlap between crypto and longevity. Now in terms of betting, on longevity. So what I'm seeing right now, again, I'm, I'm not an expert, but there, there are two ways as, a, um, as an individual to uh, potentially increase their longevity. I, I, I would call them the low-tech way and the high-tech way. The high-tech way is basically the super hardcore, like gene editing, like super hardcore drugs, um, you know, blood transfusion, like uh, stuff like that, right? That stuff is not ready yet, at least not from uh, what I'm seeing. Like, I don't think even the, the billionaires have access to some of these techs. It's just not ready. It takes, it'll still take maybe at least a decade or two of really hardcore research for things that are actionable and solutions for, for people to, to use. And by the way, sure, billionaires will have first access to these solutions, but the cost of technology um, decreases exponentially over time. So like the hard, the hard, core tech will be affordable to the average person in the long run as well. So I'm, I don't think there, there's a reason to, for people to hate on billionaires for having access to these techs. So that's the, 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 the high tech. The low tech stuff is the stuff that really works, that can increase your, your lifespan or health span by at least 10%, like just you know, eating healthy, eating super healthy, like get rid of all the simple carbs, right? Probably eat not too much protein, especially animal protein, um, sleep well, meditate, Relationships. Relationship is the, probably the most underappreciated on longevity hack, like friendship, spending mm. time with family, because that actually decreases your cortisol level, which is related to insulin, which again is related to longevity. Anyway, so just uh, naming a bunch of things. No, that's great. No, 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 that's great. That, that's, that's what I was looking for. Is there, are there any, like, um, any people that you follow? Like, is there longevity Twitter? Like, are there longevity podcasts? Like, are any, any interesting resources you'd recommend? There is a longevity Twitter. Uh, there aren't that many people, um, but uh, I can share that later. But uh, I, I like listening to Peter Atias' uh, podcast. Um, I sometimes listen to David Sinclair as well. Uh, there's a website called uh, Lifespan.io. Uh, people should check it out. And then there's um, a newsletter by uh, the founder of Repair Technologies. His name is Reason. He has a really good newsletter. And then there's a news newsletter by uh, Nathan Chang, who is the founder of Ondex Longevity um, Track. Um, it's, uh, it's, it's also a great newsletter. So I, I would recommend mm -hmm. these newsletters if you want to yeah Keep up no, that's great if you ever want to uh i think there's probably a lot of folks who are pretty interested in this in the same way that there's a lot of crypto folks interested in psychedelics as well um i've noticed 
Yeah. So I don't know. It might be interesting if you want to sp- tweet that out and share some resources. Cause I think a lot of people would find it interesting. So, all right. Last question that I ask, uh, I'm just going to start asking a lot of people is, uh, what's, what's no one thinking about you think in crypto that feels pretty obvious to you? I'm not really sure why people are not talking about decentralized social media. It, it, it seems really obvious to me that the web two giants are begging for disruption. Um, they, they, they got, so, they gathered so much power over the last 10 years and we finally have a technology to disrupt them, to um, decrease their, their bargaining power against their users, right? So we will have decentralized media where creators have, can get a um, much bigger share of the revenue, which otherwise would be earned by, by the, the platform themselves. And also uh, a platform where the, the creators and users cannot be unilaterally deplatformed um, by the owner. Um, there isn't a lot of people talking about this, but it, it's, it's so obvious to me it's going to happen. I think I have two reasons maybe why, um, two counter arguments to that. Um, first is that a lot of folks in 2017 remember the social, social media argument. Uh, and, and, you know, I think it was EOS who launched like voice.com to be the social platform, like bought the domain name for 30 million bucks. Like yeah. that felt like a very 2017 narrative that. And I think there are some folks who got rooted in these 2017 narratives not playing out. So that feels like one reason why it's probably taking longer. And then the second reason is that uh, switching, I would say. So like if you want to switch from if there's a better Bank of America or a better like I just got a mortgage through Wells Fargo. It's like brutal process. So if someone comes around with like a Web3 way to get a mortgage and way, way, way better right? Way, way better. I'm like, okay, no brainer. I'll leave Bank of America. I'll leave Wells Fargo immediately. If someone's like, there's a better Instagram and I'm like, well, I like Instagram or like, I like Twitter. Right. And I think it's, it's not for the, like the users don't feel like anything's broken. Whereas the users of things like Bank of America understand that it's broken. There's just not a better alternative. The users of Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, they love it. It's only a very small minority of folks who are the creators who think that it's broken. Now, the counter to what I just said is probably that creators drive the users, so bring the creators over. But that, those, that's my yeah. two cents on that. Uh, I agree with you. Like Creating a, a 10x better decentralized version of Web2 social media is going to be very difficult. And there is a good chance that, you know, Twitter is building this. Twitter is trying to decentralize themselves, right? So there is a good chance Loose that guy. Web2... Yeah. yeah. There is a good chance that some of the Web2 giants are going to decentralize themselves. Yeah, I agree. I agree. Uh, too bad they're all owned by Facebook. So, um, <laughs> cool. Well, Chad, this was, a, I love this conversation. I'm happy that we got to do this. Um, you're on Twitter, uh, DeFi Alliance. I don't know what your new name is going to be, but for now, I think folks can just uh, Google DeFi Alliance. I'm sure you come up, but anywhere else yeah. that we should send people? Um, those are the main things. Cool. All right, my friend. We'll be well. Yeah. Enjoy the rest of the day. And uh, thanks for again for coming on the podcast. Yeah, likewise. Thank you, Jason. Good job.